Hey, what's up guys? Today I'm going to give you a quick video on some of the techniques that I use during my creation of perfect matter in order to quickly create highly detailed three-dimensional environments non-destructively. So we're going to go ahead and get right into that. So before you, you can see like three um, separate models. So over here is like the, uh, the white box and it's also acting as our collision. Here we have our low poly and here we have our high poly. And the really interesting thing about this is all of these models are actually identical. Because if I go over to this one and up my subsurf level, you'll notice that all the detail pops out. Likewise, if I go into edit mode, you'll notice that the model is exactly the same here. And that's because all of these details are being created procedurally. And there are huge benefits to this. For a start, it's very, very quick. Like this whole thing took me about a quarter of an hour, 15 minutes. And all of these things can be changed and adjusted on the fly. So if I increase um, my detail level, let's go, um, I don't want to go too high just so I don't slow my machine down. Uh, but if I go over to the modifier stack, you'll notice I can change lots of different variables. So I'm just going to locate a decent one. Here we go. So we got like our outer bounds one, which is these kind of spiky regions on the top. And we can do really cool things like I can increase um, how aggressive the actual spikes are, but I can also change them entirely. So if I change these numbers, it will actually shift them around and give a completely different look to our environment. All of that has been done non-destructively, which means we've maintained our base collision. So I'm going to go into a bit more detail on how you do that. So I'm going to duplicate our white box. So let's just assume you have a white box ready for this process. It helps to have mostly quadded geometry. So if it's quite tidy, this is just going to make the process easier. As you can see, mine's not perfect either. I have uh, triangles in the odd places. So you really don't have to be absolutely precise with this. So the first step, we want to allocate which regions are going to inhibit which appearances. So if I go into the um, uh, kind of like the settings here, the object data, uh, we've got our vertex groups. So what we're actually going to do is assign certain areas to our vertex groups. So I want this upper bit to be kind of like an outlands area, like a boundary that you're not going to venture outside of. And what I can do is actually give that a name. I'm going to call it outlands. And then I'm going to assign uh, those different polygons to that, or the vertices. I'd also like kind of like a danger area. So an area that might be inside the um, explorable environment, but actually you don't want people to go there and discourage them with the appearance. So I'm going to assign that to the danger area. I also want to do like maybe a ceiling for some interesting decoration and not necessarily anything that's going to like uh, mean much but it's just going to kind of like give the um, give the environment like a nice feel. So if I apply that as well. And then last but not least I also want to have the walls so they're distinguishable from the area that you can walk on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select a loop around here and then I'm going to select all faces that have like a similar normal. So that's done a pretty good job. I'm going to deselect a few of these areas. Yeah, that looks good enough. And then what I'm going to do is assign that um, to the walls. So let's actually make a new one. Nearly messed it up. <laughs> right, there we go. So if I go onto ceiling, deselect. Okay, great. So yeah, as you can see, we can individually select our different areas. Um, and you don't have to do this all right at the beginning. It's good to have like a good outline, but you can actually tweak these as you go along through the procedural workflow. So the next thing is we're going to want to get some shape to our environment that starts to look a bit more appealing. So we're going to up some subsurf levels and you can already see that this is starting to show like a slightly more um, organic look to it. But we want to make sure that it doesn't lose too much shape. So we want to go around um, in edit mode. In fact, if you click this here, it's going to make it a bit easier to see the geometry. And we're going to try and like better define some of the areas. It's going to help if we do this in shade smooth since this is going to be more closely representative of the finished model. So now I'm going to go around and um, basically make these loop cuts in order to give like certain areas of the environment a bit more definition. You can also slide some of the loop cuts just so they don't uh, add too much of a synthetic feel to certain areas that are meant to be more organic. As you can see, my topology is helping out here relatively well. It's not perfect, you could probably do a much better job, but the quads are definitely helping uh, define the actual geometry itself much better. So to be honest, I'd, I'd say this is relatively good for a very rough go. You can see where the definition of the environment is, and it's much easier to isolate areas with your eyes. 
and see what areas might actually be explorable and which ones aren't. And the glorious thing about this is all of our uh, vertex data has been preserved. Something else that'd be really good to do at this time is to UV unwrap. Because the, um, because the topology is still very low, you can really do this at any stage, but I find it quite helpful to do it early in advance. I'm not going to do that here because, you know, I don't really want to show how to unwrap when really I just want to be kind of like getting across the idea of this procedural modeling. So I'm going to put that off to the side. So we can actually hide this, uh, this subsurf thing. But first we can, you know, we want to have a relatively high level of detail. So if we go to four, that's going to give us um, enough definition to maintain our workflow without getting too much lag, but also seeing like what a lot of our things are doing. So if you open up the modifiers, we can actually find a displacement. Now it's going to look a bit crazy at first, and I'm going to set the mid-level to uh, to zero, just so it's not, um, just so all of our uh, displacement extrudes off the surfaces as opposed to kind of like pushes downwards. And I also want to turn the definition down a fair bit just to start off with. We're going to go over like the top parts first. I think that'd be quite a good place to start off. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to press new because we want to create a new texture and I'm going to call this like the outlands texture. Once we've done that, we can open up the um, texture here and you can do anything you want here. Um, I'd recommend watching my previous video on how to make uh, procedural 3D assets because I explain this a bit more. Uh, but for this time round, I'm just going to assume that you've watched it and I'm going to carry on by picking out a few different noises that we can use for our terrain. So I think Musgrave is probably quite a good one. And I'm also going to use the Voronoi F2 plus or minus F1. This gives us like kind of this really interesting like jaggedy uh, fractal pattern. So the next thing uh, that you probably notice is this is affecting our entire mesh. And we really don't want that. We just want it to be affecting the top. So if we go back to our displacement, we can actually select which vertex group we want it to affect exclusively. And you can probably start to see where this uh, how this workflow is going to be very helpful for, for us. So I'm going to make sure this is in the positives. So we've got um, extrusions coming off the top. And it already looks quite interesting. Like this could be an idea for a totally different, um, like a totally different style of terrain. Nonetheless, I'm going to try and go for these big uh, jaggedy rocks, however. So in order to do that, I'm probably going to have to up the size just so we've got uh, fewer kind of like large details. That's starting to look quite good. However, they're quite, stump uh, quite stumpy, and I'd like it to be quite big. Um, so you'll probably be jumping back and forth between these two panels and just adjusting everything. Okay, so something we're lacking uh, from, this, um, from this version is over here you can see how they're pointing off in a direction, kind of like they've been blasted by the sun and the wind. And in order to recreate that, we're going to use an extra little tool, which is quite helpful. Over here is the direction option, and we can change it from to RGB to XYZ. And as you can see, that's instantly given us the effect that we want. But I want to explain this a little bit more because it's very, very useful. This won't always like go exactly how you want, but if you open up the color ramp option inside your texture and click this white area, if you slide it up and down, you'll notice that it changes the values quite a lot. And we can actually do it with color as well. Now this is where the RGB comes in. It's because the RGB actually represents the direction that it goes. So if we get it to blue, which is equal to Z, it's going to point straight upwards. However, if you give it an equal number of um, R, G, and B, which is white, it will point off in sort of like a diagonal direction. But you can use this to control which direction you actually want it to point from. So it's a really, really helpful feature. And you can also scale the color for your strength control. I feel like there's too many jaggedy bits on this. Over here, you can see how it's spaced out. They feel a bit more independent and a bit less like kind of artificial. Although this is a look you could totally validly go for. What I quite like to do is, um, I think I reduce the intensity here a little bit or increase, um, yeah, reduce the intensity just so we um, don't have any plateaus because if your intensity is too high, you get the plateau. So we want kind of like the knife sharp uh, pointed edges on everything. Okay, that's about right. Now what we can do is if we reduce the brightness here, it's actually going to crop off the lower end and like kind of sink the rocks into the terrain. And if we do that, we can actually get this area in between the rocks. Kind of looks a bit like sand, but we can come back to that later. That's roughly what we were looking for. There are other variables here to play around with, um, such as like controlling the sizing of these individual kind of like um, kind of like noise patterns, as well as like governing how intense they are. But I'm just going to leave it as as this for now, seeing as those are things that you could totally experiment with and play around. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do like maybe the ceiling parts, because that's another one that uses an interesting technique. So I'm just going to go to the modifier stack and displace again. Going to go through the usual routine, setting, setting this to zero, reducing the strength just so it's not so crazy, and we're going to make a new uh, texture. 
So I'm going to call these like, uh, let's just call it the ceiling rocks. Just to be literal about it. And then if we come over to here, it's quite helpfully um, saved what we were last doing. And actually we can probably work from this. So if I go over here, let's make sure we've got ceiling selected, just so that's the only thing we're editing. Let's get a low angle so we can see what we're doing a little bit better. Now I want the sizes to be quite small, because these are going to be like uh, stalactites or stalagmites, whichever way around it is. Um, so I'm going to make them a bit smaller, just so they point, um, just so they can look a bit sharper. And then we, of course we can come back and control the strength until we're getting something closer to what we want. Just worry about the length for now. I know it looks a bit crazy, and again, it could be something you're going for. But let's just start by getting the kind of the rock shapes that we want. I'd also recommend not making these too sharp, because when you go down increments for your low polys, you might uh, sacrifice a lot of detail. If I go down to subdiv 2, you'll notice all of them have gone. Which is why it's important to keep cycling between them all, to make sure that you're get, striking a good level of detail. So I'm going to open this up again, and um, I definitely want them a little bit finer, but not much. So perhaps I'll change the size a tiny bit. There we go. I'm working at quite a low poly, so these don't look particularly nice now, but if I go up to subdiv 5, and then maybe play around with these, um, play around with these different parameters a bit more. <coughs> okay, it's looking relatively good now. Um, I'm just going to sync them into the wall a little bit more, so I'm going to drop down my subdivs just so it's a bit easier to work. I'm going to use that brightness technique and just bring them in a tiny bit more. This is a great low resolution uh, sort of look, they're quite pointed and when we increase the uh, the resolution later on for our high poly, you're going to start noticing the detail coming back through again. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to uh, fix this problem where they're pointing in like weird directions. So if we go onto the direction option and change it to Z, they're only going to be pointing upwards or downwards. As you can see it's pointing upwards currently but we can fix that by changing, by inverting this. And now we've got some rocks that look like they're hanging directly downwards. I'm noticing a bit of an error here, where we must have accidentally selected some of the areas that we weren't meant to, but this is very very easy to fix. Because it's non-destructive, we can go back and, uh, and adjust all of our vertex groups again. So let's go ahead and select all of our ceiling areas. Yeah, okay, so something about this just isn't really working quite right. So I'm going to remove some of them until we lose this option here of them kind of causing us problems. Okay, so there we go. If we remove these... That's fixed some of it over there. There we go. And then let's come over here. This is already starting to look much better. I'm not going to fiddle around with it too much because, as you can see, the idea is kind of like getting across. Inside of our caves, underneath these overhangs, we've got our stalactites, and they look really, really good. So if I increase the resolution, you're going to get a better representation of how they might look on the high poly. And if you're exclusively working in high poly, you know, that's great because you're going to have a lot more detail that you can work with. I think these look okay. They kind of get the idea across, so I'm just going to move on now. I'm going to go back to subdiv 4, and maybe start looking at the ground here. I think after this one, you guys will probably understand where I'm going with this, and I won't go into too much detail. So the next step, I'm going to go back over, create another displace, make sure that we select the right region, which is our danger area create a new uh, a new texture and actually these ceiling rocks are probably going to serve us quite well we just want the area to look quite treacherous and it's already created it as kind of like a default which is really really helpful let's have it pointing upwards with the z option and get the mid level down to zero again let's open up our texture and start playing around with the variables so i'm going to increase the um the size because i don't really want these needles sharp they don't have to look um lethal they just kind of have to look discouraging for example this, that doesn't necessarily look like it'll kill you if you drop onto it, but if you're playing a video game, that might not necessarily look like traversable terrain, and that's all that you're really trying to get across. If I bring it out of the ground a little bit more, it might even just reinforce that idea a bit. There we go, that's much better. And if I go into maybe F, um, Control 5 for subdiv, yeah, we're starting to see the details come through a bit more now. Excellent. So from a distance you can already see where this is, um, where this is sort of going. And you literally just keep layering things up and up and yeah, pretty much just like carving out your design. And because this is all non-destructive, you can change these variables at any time. 
Now I'm going to actually go over to my other model again and start to explain some of the things I didn't go into detail over, mainly because they're quite finicky and they're things that are good to explore on your own. So the next thing is this wall here. You can see that it's kind of like got this clouds noise thing. Um, might be best demonstrated over here where I've actually got my empties working. So if I go into subdiv 5 to help us see more of that detail, this empty here, if I grab and move it, if it will allow me. Okay, that's a bit laggy, so do you know what I'm going to hide this? Yeah, let's just hide them all. Okay, so if I grab this empty and um, basically shift it around a bit, there we go. You can see that the pattern is actually shifting. So if I go down slightly lower again, just so we're not lagging as much, as I move the empty around, it's controlling the displacement on our mesh. And this is a really, really useful technique. So this one, I think, is for the walls? Yeah, there we go. So we can see the noise is moving, and you can rotate them and squash them, which is how I got this layered effect. You can see this empty here is actually quite flat. It's because I've squashed it in order to give it a nice, like, kind of layered, rocky effect. So if I open up the stack here, the way that you do that is you simply create an empty, and you can change the coordinate system to object, and then select that empty, and then it'll be governed by the location of your other object. But once you have your, your finished model and you're, you're able to save that out, um, you can save out as a low poly, um, as an FBX, and then also save out your high poly as well. And because it's so easy to cycle back and forth between the levels of detail, you can pretty much just cycle up and down all day long and decide on exactly what it is that you want. I really hope that was a super useful video and that you learned something from this. So thank you so much for watching. I really, really hope this was helpful. Please check out the trailer for Perfect Matter. I'm really excited about releasing it and a lot of the techniques I showed you in this video today was used in the level design of that game. So thank you so much and I'll see you guys next time. Bye bye.